everyone, welcome to my show today. I'm Deborah Neiman, the voice behind the Thrifty Homesteader blog, as well as several books on homesteading and raising goats. Today, my son-in-law, Ryan Barfoot, an urban homesteader, and I are gonna be talking to author Christy Hemingway, who wrote the books, The Thinking Beekeeper and Advanced Top Bar Beekeeping. This is gonna be so much fun, so here we go. So it's great to have you here. I'm really excited um, to talk to you about your experience with bees and everything. So can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about how you got started with bees? I can, how I got started with bees. Um, basically began because I, I moved to Maine and got very fascinated with the alpaca business. And I thought for a long time that I wanted to be an alpaca farmer, but that really turned out to be not my thing when I got up there and in order to be close to the animals, I started Gold Star Alpacas. So I became New England's only professional alpaca herd sitter. And that meant that I saw uh, a whole lot of alpaca farms, and yet I wasn't chained to my own farm, which is what I really realized that these people were. You, you've got these animals, you have to be there to take care of them every day. So. I really had a much better time being gold star alpacas and I did some training and of course the herd sitting and feeding and and um, then I decided I was going to like expand a little bit so I'm going to offer shearing services and so I wound up connecting with a guy named Al Maloney he ran a farm called New Aim Farm out in Waterboro, Maine and this was probably 2006 maybe seven 2007 and uh he said he was willing to teach me how to shear an alpaca. So I said, okay, we go out there and we wrestle these six alpacas and they get some, some very bad haircuts. And uh, at the end of the day, we're sort of standing there congratulating ourselves. And he reaches over to a shelf inside his barn and picks up a jar and he hands me this jar. And I looked at the jar and I said, what is this? And he said, it's honey. And I said, what? because it doesn't look anything like you see in the grocery store with your little squeezy jar, et cetera. So it was opaque and really thick, and a little bit of foamy stuff going on. And I said, what, where did it come from? And he said, from my bees. And I said, what, you have bees? And one of those defining moments in life where suddenly you realize, I'm really excited about that. And he started going, whoa, 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 <laughs> wall of enthusiasm, trying not to get knocked over by it. And uh, he promised that he would send me an email when the Knox and King County beekeepers told him when bee school would start. And I said, what, there's a bee school? And he said, yes. <laughs> so, so he did, and I went to bee school. And the big exciting thing for me about bee school after, after weeks of, you know, do this and do that, and you know, this is a queen and a worker and a drone and all the stuff that you get in bee school, was they, were, they promised us a panel the last class where we could ask any question we wanted of this whole experienced panel of beekeepers so we get to that class and i'm uh i have noted about myself that i have a tendency to disrupt things if i have a question i'm intent on getting the answer to so i thought surely someone else will want to know this i'm just going to sit on my hands but what i wanted to hear was what did bees do before we gave them wax foundation so i thought Somebody will ask, I'm just going to listen. So I listen, I listen, I listen, I'm sitting on my hands. Don't put your hand up, don't put your hand up. And it went on and on and on, and nobody asked that question. And I said, okay, I have to know. <laughs> All on me, call on me. What did bees do before we gave them this wax foundation stuff? And, and the room just literally went to crickets. It was, it was a silent as a tomb. And I just thought, that is a huge alarm bell to me. And I started looking for other methods of beekeeping besides the typical square box hive that we're so used to in the United States called the Langstroth hive, uh, where typically the frames inside have a template made of wax or nowadays plastic uh, to sort of help the bees figure out how to make hexagons. As if bees needed help with hexagons. But at that point, I was Googling like crazy looking for organic beekeeping or natural beekeeping, and I fell across a couple people. Uh, Michael Bush for one out in Nebraska, Phil Chandler over in England, and the idea of top bar hives. And the coolest thing about a top bar hive from my point of view, since I think this waxing is so important, is that the bees make their own wax. It hangs down from a top bar, makes the comb just like you've seen chunks of comb for sale in the store. All of that naturally made from the little wax glands in a bee's belly. So 
the reason that's super important to me is in about the middle 80s, we got hit with this bug called the Varroa mite. And the Varroa mite developed a, sort of a, a zero tolerance response from beekeepers who went after it hammer and tong with heavy duty chemicals. One of them was an organophosphate and the other one is a synthetic pyrethroid. But in any case, you, you treat the hive, you treat the hive, you treat the hive, and the mites eventually develop a resistance to this chemical. So now we change chemicals and we treat and we treat and we treat and retreat. And, and now we've got wax that's been treated with multiple chemicals multiple times. You don't really know what's in it and it's old and you're like, okay, this is gross. So you send it away and it gets recycled into fresh foundation. But the problem with that is that all of those chemicals were lipophilic. So they were being absorbed into the bee flax and then that stuff doesn't like evaporate or disappear when it's melted down. So when you make fresh foundation out of it, it's already loaded up and contaminated with the same chemicals that you're gonna try to use to kill mites that the mites are already resistant to. So it was making it, it was, it was basically creating a super mite and a sicker bee. It drove me nuts. <laughs> and, and once I got interested in the idea of top bar hives and their own natural wax, I, I just find that the foundation qualifies as one of the most horrific things we've ever done to bees. So that was my, uh, my defining moment. Once I discovered that top bar hives were a thing uh, and I realized I was sort of out there on the, you know, you are not doing the mainstream bee thing, it was too late. I was already committed to the idea. And uh, when I do a talk now, it's the big takeaway point for me, the one thing that I care that you know when you're done is that it's all about flat. It's, Clean, fresh wax made by bees for bees is just central to their life. They store their food in there. They raise their babies in that wax. It, it's, it's so core to their existence that for us to mess with it as humans, we are, we are not making good choices there. And it's really scary for us too. Like the big thing that jumped out at me when you were talking about the wax having all these chemicals in it mm -hmm. is that so many body care products are made from beeswax. And you think, you see beeswax on a label and you think, oh, that's so pure and natural and everything. And I, I've never seen it say organic beeswax. Right. So you'll that's see the same thing with honey. You'll say pure honey or pure beeswax. And all they're really telling you is that we didn't add anything else besides beeswax in here. But if you take foam from a hive that's been treated with miticides and you melt it down you've got all those chemicals and then you know you're taking whatever liquid and hardening it up with beeswax and calling that lip balm then yeah you're the body care products that you're making even though we'd like to consider it all pure are treated by the beekeeper intentionally by the beekeeper to control for all mites with some heavy duty chemicals that you don't really want to be putting in or on your body drives me crazy drives me absolutely crazy so there's another thing about the wax. You want to go another step deeper with me on the science of the beeswax? Sure. Okay. The queen is not necessarily in charge of whether she's going to lay a worker bee or a drone bee. She comes up to the cells, uses her forelegs, and measures the size of the cell and says, oh, this is a worker bee cell. So she puts her tail in the cell, and a worker bee egg will be fertilized. She has a little valve called a spermatheca. She turns on the sperm, she fertilizes that egg. That egg will now turn into a worker bee. She comes up to another cell, a larger cell, and goes, oh, this is a drone cell. She puts her tail in the cell, she lays that egg, she doesn't fertilize it, it turns into a drone. Now there's a, there's a big rabbit hole you could go down there with genetics and diploid and haploid and chromosomes and all of that. But the point is, the size of the cell is crucial to what the queen knows what to do. So we came along and we created a foundation. Probably we never looked at it, but we know today that natural cell size made by a natural size bee is about 4.9 millimeters. And no, I don't know why it's in millimeters and not inches, but anyway, 4.9 millimeter cell. And we created this foundation with all one size. That size is about 5.4 millimeters. And that's all intended to make workers that basically tries to eliminate drones altogether, not good for your genetic diversity. But it's also, like I said, about a half a millimeter bigger than the natural size bee would be. And that half a millimeter throws a whole different kind of wrench in the works. Adding a half a millimeter to the width of the cell size adds about 24 hours to the length of the bee's gestation cycle. Adding 24 hours means that about 
half of it is while it's uncapped and still in the larval stage, and the other half after it's capped and it's now metamorphosizing from a little grub into a honeybee. So big deal, right? What's 24 hours? But the problem is the varroa mite has to work with the gestation cycle of the bee in order to reproduce. So your varroa mite comes running across the foundation, finds an open cell with a larva, and it goes down underneath that larva, turns herself upside down, and has little snorkely breathing tubes so that she can be buried in this brood food, which is liquid, and stay alive. So now the egg gets laid. The cap goes on. Sorry, the egg has been laid, and then the, the mite is in there. And now the bees cap the cell because it's going to go from larva to pupa. And she needed more time to get that, which she got that extra 12 hours gave her more opportunity to get in that cell. And then once the bees have capped that cell, there's an extra 12 hours involved in the pupa stage. And that's when mama mite comes out from under the baby bee and starts to lay eggs. She starts with a boy egg and then she lays female eggs at intervals until the, the bee hatches and comes out. Well, anything you do to change that size, especially if it makes it larger, is extending the success rate for the varroa mite to get into the cell and her opportunities to make baby mites. So if you wanted to just hand something to the varroa mites on a silver platter, that was the thing to do. Make the cells bigger, make them all the same size, mess up your genetic diversity, and here we are today going, man, this varroa mite thing is really, really hard stuff to fight with the bees. And you know, you're looking at it and going, hmm, was that mites? Is that the reason my hive died? What's the problem here? But the real critical thing with varroa mites at this point is they transmit viruses and they vector everything that they come in contact with. So just like a parent sending a five-year-old kid to kindergarten, you take your beehive out to California for the almonds like we do with migratory pollinators and it comes in contact with every possible disease or virus that a bee could carry and we're just spreading it all around. Because varroas are very, very effective at taking something you don't want and moving it somewhere else where you don't want it there either. So we really have kind of dug a hole for ourselves with the whole varroa mite problem, which frankly, for all we know, there were varroa mites before we knew we had varroa mites in the 80s. We just didn't see as many of them because maybe there wasn't quite, uh, quite the prevalence of the foundation. But nowadays, it's very common to use foundation and nobody really realizes or thinks about it or wants to face the fact that we've contaminated all the foundation and the foundation is changing that gestation cycle which is more far more helpful to the varroa mite than it will ever be for the honeybees wow that's fascinating i can see where a lot like most people wouldn't think that 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 would be a big deal especially like the amount the size difference between the natural comb and the artificial comb right. doesn't sound that hugely significant, but obviously if you're a bee, it is. Right. For me, a half a millimeter, I need my glasses to see it. But if I was this big, a half a millimeter is a whole lot bigger percentage of my size of the world. Right. So it, it, it seems tiny. It had a lot of unintended consequences that all sort of rolled downhill. And, uh, you know, it's one of the risks I think we take when we mess around with natural systems. So trying to get back to the natural system was more or less my focus when I wanted to quit using foundation. And the easiest way to not use foundation is to use a top bar hive because they just hang down from above, make their own comb in this catenary curve shape, which is all gravity based. It's how they make comb in trees and the cell size starts to get smaller and goes back down to that natural 4.9 millimeter, give or take a little bit. Yeah, all that over a half a millimeter. Wow. Is there a difference in the amount of time that it takes to run a top bar hive versus a Langstroth hive? That is a really good question. Um, I think, well, the, the short answer is yes, there's a difference. Why is there a difference? I think it's, it's twofold. First of all, with a Langstroth hive, one of the advantages from the commercial hurry up, got to get a lot of work done beekeeper is the comb is surrounded by a rectangular wooden frame. And so it's somewhat protected and you can pick it up and, and handle it a little roughly. You can lean it against the side of a hive while you need to do something else, that sort of stuff. With a top bar hive, you've got a bar and then you have just a piece of wax and you can't, set it down any old way. The only way you can really set it down is upside down. Turn it upside down and set it on its head. Um, so you have to be a little more careful. It's not surrounded by that frame. So if you take your bar 
if this was your comb to comb and you turned that bar like this, it's only attached in a straight line at the bar. And so it becomes like a hinge. So if it's warm out and you turn the bar like this, you're likely to have it go plop and fall right off. That won't happen with a Langshroth hive because it's surrounded by a wooden frame. The other hassle with putting the wooden frame on it from the bee's point of view is that when bees reproduce, it's called swarming. They need to make a swarm cell. The swarm cell is made on the edge of the comb. So if there's a wooden frame in the way, they have to kind of moosh the wax out over to get that cell vertical on the edge. So that's a challenge for them. They seem to overcome it okay, but you know, we think that about everything we've asked them to do in the last hundred years. And I'm, I would say that maybe we shouldn't think that way about that. But so you can be quicker when you have the frame around it if you're in a hurry. But I think that the people that are more interested in, in the natural systems that the bees would be utilizing in a tree are not in such a hurry. They're not probably keeping several thousand hives and trying to get through X number per day to keep their bottom line good. They're much more interested in the health of the bees, supporting how they would make their nests naturally and handling them you know, with, with some some love and respect and and maybe we're all a little woo-woo about it too but you know there's a connection to your bees that starts to happen that nobody can really prepare you for you just suddenly go i can't seem to go and do anything i need to do today i just want to sit here and look at my bees you know so they're that compelling and uh so there isn't as much interest in hurrying in that case so but you can uh you could probably bang through a langtruth inspection pretty quickly i have found that to do on a full, what I consider a full, so we're talking like 28 or 30 bars of comb, on a full top bar hive, that inspection's probably 45 minutes, right around there. Whereas you could probably get through a Langshroth hive if you were truly in a hurry and being efficient about it in probably 20. So, and how often do you have to do that? About once a week. Okay. It's, it's kind of funny, people used to ask me a lot, well, how much time do I have to invest in my bees? And I would say less than chickens <laughs> because you got to talk to your chickens every day. They go in, they go out, you feed them daily, blah, blah, blah. Your bees, you probably, if even in the heaviest uh, time that you need to feed, probably don't have to even check the feeder, but twice a week, three times outside. And then you're spending 45 minutes a week doing uh, a fairly thorough inspection. And funny about that too, when you're brand new, it takes 45 minutes because you're new. When your hive gets bigger, you're faster and you're more confident, but it still takes 45 minutes because the hive is so much bigger. So about, about an hour a week per hive is the, usually the number that makes sense to use as a rule of thumb. And uh, you know, obviously that's less than chickens just by virtue of only being one touch per week. So it's not, um, it's not labor intensive like some things can be. They don't have to be fed you know, like on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, it's really harder to try to close them up than it is to, you know, just go be bees. That's, that's the deal. Go and, go and fly and be bees. It's, it's important that they be flying because they don't want to defecate in the hive. So they need to be able to out and they need to be able to ventilate and they need to be able to collect water and all of that stuff. So they're pretty uh, self-sustaining and you need to look at them because my personal reason for why you need to look at them. The first thing is you need to make sure that the wax is straight on the bar so that you can do an inspection. You can't inspect your hive. You can't find queenlessness. You can't find American fowl brood, very terrifying and very contagious bee disease. And you just aren't really paying the right amount of attention to your hive. So once a week, take a look, make sure things are on track and otherwise, they do their thing. Feed them if there's no nectar out there. So it's not, it's a pretty low maintenance uh, form of wildlife or livestock or pet or however you want to view keeping a, a box full of stinging insects around your house on purpose. <laughs> I had no idea the degree of issues that are caused by Verona mites. And it raises the question for me is how do you manage them or have you encountered them? Well, good question. I have been working for most of the time that Gold Star Honeybees has existed with a bee yard that sells packaged bees, commercially available packaged bees, and that bee yard has been treatment free. And so when I get hold of the bees, I'm monitoring for a mite problem, and I have never had 
a serious mite problem at all with those bees. But <laughs> I think it's super important. And like, if I could get two things across in a, in a talk, it would be, it's all about the wax and monitor, monitor, monitor. One of the reasons we have the agricultural problems that we have is that we began to say, okay, well, you got to spray for this and you got to treat for that and you got it. So what day is it? Okay, that's the right day to treat with this chemical. If you don't have the problem, you shouldn't be treating. And if we had not got into that calendar based, you know, like here's what day it is, you got to put this chemical down, we would probably not have gone through the whole DDT thing and you know all those things where you gotta you gotta use this stuff. So, <clears throat> um, starting out with treatment tree bees was great. They were also raised on foundation, but small cell foundations, so they were a smaller bee. So they were making smaller cells. So they were doing that sort of integrated pest management step on their own. But then you really have to know what your numbers are. And it's becoming a thing now that like you get to a bee conference and, and the local apiarist, the state guy will say, hey, you know, what are your numbers? And if you haven't been monitoring for your mites, you don't know what your numbers are. So it matters to find a way to monitor. So nowadays, the sample size that they seem to think works best is 300 bees. That's about a half a cup of bees. So you've got to get a half a cup of bees, and then you've got to do something that knocks the mites off of them. Now, you can do a couple things there. The easiest and the kindest to the bees is powdered sugar. So you throw them in a jar, throw the powdered sugar in there, shake, rattle, and roll, two minutes of banging them around, and most of the mites. For some reason, the sugar makes their feet sort of lose their grip, and now you've got the mites loose in the sugar. You can let the bees go. You throw water into that sugar. The sugar disappears. You can see the mites. It's a little more work than the average beekeeper wants to do, you know, but once you know that out of my 300 bees, I saw one Varroa mite, that's pretty good compared to the person who's like, uh oh, I got 34. That person's in serious trouble. So the idea of doing it with sugar, like I said, doesn't kill any bees. The next one, which is a little faster, is an alcohol wash. It's the same kind of thing. You throw rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol into that thing, shake them and shake them and shake them, the mites pop off. You can so knowing what your numbers are is crucial because if you know that number then you can take that to places that say well in our area because it is kind of local beekeeping is global but it's also very micro local and to be able to compare mite loads to be able to say how many mites you had per 300 bees now you can get on somebody's chart who has an opinion about how many mites is too many mites then you can make a decision whether you need to treat or not and you, that's an informed decision and that that informed piece is worth having, truly worth having. So once you've got a number, now you've got a decision to make. If it's too high, then you want to do something. You absolutely want to do something. The softest and gentlest and uh, least chemically thing that you can do is shake powdered sugar down on all your bees. Because the fact that it makes it slippery and they lose their grip throws a lot of those mites out of the hive and they can't climb back up in. So that's beautiful, integrated pest management, mechanical method, that's awesome. The problem is that does nothing for the mites that are under those doggone brood caps because no powder sugar gets in there, doesn't, doesn't do a thing for you. So that's where oxalic acid started to make sense. And when I got myself over to Italy, thanks to having written a book about bees that got translated and then <laughs> weirdest thing in the world to have people say, now we'd like to introduce you famous American author, Christy Hemingway, and I was still turning around for who were they talking about, right? But getting to interact with Italians over bees was amazing, just amazing. And so they are very big on the organic aspect of it, and they apparently were pretty savvy to the fact that oxalic acid, unlike the other miticides that we've used since the 80s, is not lipophilic. Fancy word for that stuff getting absorbed into beeswax, which is essentially a fat. Lipophilic means fat loving. So oxalic acid is 95% effective when you use it when there's very little brood, and it's not lipophilic. So it's not contaminating your wax, and yet it's doing a number on the varroa mites. So you can shake powder sugar, we've got to do pretty regularly, or you can hit them with oxalic acid at a low brood point and it just does such a great bang up job of taking care of it and it doesn't end up in the wax because remember it's all about the wax right wait a second after everything 
everything you just said, now I'm thinking about candle making, beeswax being what is said to be the best as far as health wise and nature wise. Mm -hmm. Now I'm really questioning of even buying candle wax to make anything, never mind buying products with beeswax in it. Mm -hmm. Is there a certification or any type of label that we should be looking for in purchasing beeswax products? There is not. Um, it, it is likely if you purchase beeswax that the label will say pure beeswax, which is something I think we all take a lot of comfort from. You know, you notice too that it says pure honey on the jars of honey as well. But that doesn't necessarily say that there's no bad stuff in it. It simply says that all that was in there is wax or all that was in there is honey. So the beeswax thing uh, for candles drives me crazy. Because first off, a beeswax candle for some reason has a better feel. It doesn't soot the air up. It generally burns very nice, straight, doesn't drip and run. But it's also accused of ionizing the air. And I think you could probably not have to dig very deep on Google to find out that that's kind of a little load of BS. But it makes a beautiful candle and it burns slowly and it doesn't run. So that right there is, is a pretty good case for a beeswax candle over a paraffin candle. Or paraffin is a petroleum product, tends to run all over the place, has a it has a Vaseline-y sort of yicky feel to it, even as a, a burning candle. So that aspect of it, um, I think that matters a lot. Now that's a lot of that is probably aesthetics, but you know, do you really want then to look to that next level down where that wax had all those chemicals in it? Where's that going? So no, there's no certification about that. There's very little knowledge even bandied about about the subject. Uh, and, it, and it makes me wonder too. But if we move from there to the idea of body care products with beeswax in them, now you do have a pretty scary situation because those chemicals are still in that beeswax. And when you take and melt the beeswax down and those don't disappear, and then you put it into lip balm or you put it into some other body care product, something you're going to put on your lips or your face, your skin, whatever, those chemicals are in there. And that seems to me one of the most unaddressed concerns ever. I mean, generally, by the time I say that to somebody, they go, what? You know, it's, it's usually shocking to think that that it, it, pure beeswax doesn't necessarily mean that the beekeeper didn't put some of these lipophilic chemicals into their hive. So what to do about that? Uh, you know, I'm kind of looking for a good idea for that. It would be nice to be able to uh, prevent it. What I can say, um, and this is very small scale specific just to Christy Hemingway, but Marianne Frazier, formerly of Penn State University, did, uh, she participated in a study that tested, they pulled like 887 samples of bees, beeswax, uh, the dreck that falls to the bottom of your beehive, you know, all this stuff from inside the hive. And they tested it for 172 different chemicals. Yeah, exactly, 172 chemicals. And the really sad thing about that study was that all of the samples came up positive for the miticides. And then the other pesticides that the bees are exposed to when they go out in the field and bring that stuff back, that stuff ends up in the wax too, of course. But when you think about the miticides that we were purposely putting in hives to kill mites, those were in all of those samples. So I met Mary Ann Frazier the day after she was able to publicly discuss that study, after it had been peer-reviewed, released, and all of that. And I was excited because here I had this naturally made wax out of a pop bar hive. I didn't know if I was talking out my butt or what, right? You know? So I asked, could I take advantage of the wax testing system that they had in place? Because it was being subsidized to the tune of half price. So instead of 270, it cost me half of that to get it done. I sent her a piece of wax that came off the top bar. I was like, if here's my piece of top bar wax, I sent her like that much of it. It, had, it was brood comb. It was over a year old. It had been exposed to everything it was going to be exposed to as far as agriculturally, but I had never treated. So I said, how does this work? She says, you send me this, da -da -da. in about two weeks, you'll get back two pieces of paper. The first one is going to show you where you fall in the rank of clean to dirty wax. Of all the samples, where are you? And the other thing will show you specifically what we found 
based on their level of detection, which is different for every chemical, and you'll see what is in your wax. So a couple of weeks go by, I get an email, there's only one attachment. I thought, ugh, did something go wrong? You know, I'm all worried. So I'm back online, Marianne, what's going on? You know, how's come only one, one document? She said, well, did you look at the one I sent you? And I said, well, let me look at it again. So what I had to learn was that ND stands for not detected every single chemical on the list. And it was two columns, front and back, was not detected in that pizza wax that came out of the top bar hive. And I thought, you know what? If I've ever felt vindicated in my life, I probably feel that way today. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, truly, there's nothing in this wax. And I said, so why not the other piece of paper? She said, you're not on the scale. You're off the scale with how clean the wax is. So I have always made the point that it's the cleanest wax and it's designed the way the bees need it to be. And if you just let them do that, that's a top bar hive. And then, okay, I'm a beekeeper and now I don't, don't have to lift 90 pound boxes too. What's to complain about? <laughs> it's just it's an easy way to keep bees. It's good for the bees, easier for the beekeeper. And because you're not up in the chemical level and putting contaminated wax out there, it's better for the planet. So, wow, that's that's awesome. <laughs> that is so incredible. Yeah, so that's basically been the last decade of my life is learning that and trying to sort of spread that out there and advocate for let the bees make the wax. I don't care if you do it in a Langstroth hive. I mean, I sell a beautiful top bar hive, but it's not cheap, you know, and it's not easy to make. Everybody talks about it being super easy, but not if you really want it to work well. So, yeah, I'm like, what? I don't care how you keep your bees, just don't put them on foundation. <laughs> so, it's all about that. <laughs> just don't put them on foundation. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, look, Michael Bush keeps bees in Langstroth hives out in Nebraska, treatment free, foundationless. Let them make the comb. Now, the, that takes a little patience because if they don't build straight within that frame, now they're building sideways, which locks up the box and you can't get the frames in and out. But if you can get them straight, ta da. It's all beeswax made by bees for bees. Manuka <laughs> honey. Worth it or not? Mm, Manuka honey. Am saying, wait, wait, wait. Am I saying it right? You're not, actually. <laughs> it's okay. in UKA. Manuka honey. Manuka. Uh, it is said to be from the tea tree. It's Australia, New Zealand. That's pretty common stuff there. We don't probably, I don't know if there are any in the United States or not. I couldn't speak to that, but that's a big deal to them. And it has medicinal properties because tea tree is medicinal. So anytime the bees are making honey from a plant, the properties of that plant are in there. And so you got antiseptic, antimicrobial, all, all the good stuff from tea tree oil is in the honey. So is it worth it? <sighs> Flip side to the medicinal properties of the honey is the fact that it's not local unless you happen to live where there are manuka trees. So you got to kind of balance that out. Where are you going to go on what should you eat as far as the locality goes? Like, but if you carry that too far, it gets me really depressed because, you know, I lived in Maine for a dozen years and you can't grow bananas up there. So should I not be eating bananas because they weren't local? You know, like that's a slippery slope. But local honey has advantages to you in the way of like fix, working with your pollen allergies uh, that I don't know that I would apply them to Manuka honey. It's the medicinal properties are uh, definitely in the honey. Whether they're selling valid Manuka honey is the question. You know, like you can put the label on it. Nobody has any idea how much tea tree property is in it. So I might say buy local honey and buy a nice bottle of organic tea tree oil and you probably have a better, a better product as far as your own health goes. You know, if what you need is the tea tree oil, then the tea tree oil. But don't count it to be in the Manuka honey to the extent that it has a great health benefit. Does that make sense? Yes, and I'm so glad I asked that question. <laughs> yeah. So for listeners who haven't read your book, mm -hmm. The Thinking Beekeeper, which I absolutely love. You read it too? Written. The mm -hmm. intro reminds me of Omnivore's Dilemma of how you set up the history and the path in which we are at now. And I just loved reading that. But I don't think I have ever been 
quite that highly complimented that I, I said, you know, when I grow up, I want to be Michael Pollan. So, that, yeah, I love the <laughs> Nobody's ever compared my writing to his before. Now I'm like on cloud nine. Wow. But anyway, yeah, it is a concept. It's a big concept to sort of walk into, you know? Yeah, and to describe it so quickly and eloquently, I was very impressed. And it sold me on <laughs> the rest of the book, to tell you the truth. Oh, jeez. In a quick way, can you describe what is a top bar hive? I can. Um, it's a very basic box that works because we know how much space bees have to have between their combs. So if you make a top bar, and it is an inch and three-eighths inch wide, and there are multiples of these in your hive and they are all touching. Now the spacing is what the bees need to draw their brood comb, natural brood comb, all the right cell sizes, all clean wax, right? Uh, straight down from this bar. So for the beekeeper, you've got a long trough-like box with a whole bunch of top bars in it. My hive's got 29 of them in it. And the bees making that comb is that's the work, the bees do the work part. And then the only thing you have to lift when you're doing an inspection is a piece of comb hanging off of this. And if it was full of honey, as fat as it could be, it would never get over eight or 10 pounds, eight pounds probably. So there's no heavy lifting. If you put it up on the stand or you, it comes with legs, mine come with legs, it's counter height like you were chopping onions in your kitchen. So there's no bending over, none of that like awkward stuff on your back. One of the things that's been said for decades about beekeeping is that you can't be a beekeeper without a bad back. It's just like it wrecks you physically to stand there bent to inspect or to lift those boxes. So it's wow, just a matter really of motivational. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's just it's just super easy. One top bar, you're looking at a piece of comb and then you turn it over, look at the other side and the in and the out. It's it's um it's a whole different how do I describe it? It's, it's a whole different mindset as far as how you're doing the inspection because you're able to just sort of interact more gently with the bees. And, and, and just to, to prove that point, I, I usually forget to even bring this up, but I will not, as a rule, get into a Langstroth hive without a lit smoker. I own a smoker, but you know, the only time I've ever used it has been on a Langstroth hive. So when you get into the top bar, you pick up one bar, let's say it was out of the middle of the hive, you got bars coming up to here and there's a piece of comb here and a piece of comb here and here's the, here's the bar that you took out and it has a piece of comb so you've got one side two sides three sides four sides that are exposed to the outside environment and that's just that uh, just doesn't get them riled up i have never smoked a top bar hive i've never seen the need i've gotten stung yeah but they are stinging insects you know? so it's not that surprising to me that you get stung now and again but when you open up a Langstroth hive and you take the lid off, because the, the frames don't touch at the top, so there's you know space between them, when you take the lid off, all of their climate control goes whoosh right out the top. And they come up to the top and they look at you and they're pretty grouchy about it. And smoke fills their whole environment with smoke so that the pheromones that drive their world are confused. They don't know where the alarm's coming from. They can't focus on it. They can't run over and sting it because they don't. They can't tell where it is. So it's a, it's a good uh, subterfuge technique, you know, to keep the bees from paying attention to you. But in a top bar hive, it's just not that big a deal. It is just, they're mellow. <laughs> Speculate all day as to why that is, except I think it's mostly you know you aren't ripping their whole environment apart so abruptly, and they're just pretty easy going about it. So listening to you speak, I'm picking up a lot of themes on biomimicry, which is really interesting mm -hmm. to us as homesteaders, mm -hmm. people in permaculture, and I would assume a lot of our listeners. And it looks like that little comb wooden space, if looking at the bottom, is looks like that it would uh, mimic like the uh, bark on a tree. Or is there something else that it may be mimicking, or am I completely wrong about everything? No, I think that I think the top bar hives and biomimicry are definitely hand in hand. I think you hit that nail right on the head. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about this top bar. It's doing a couple things. The hive body itself, the interior of the hive body, get to a white background, will go like this. So the distance between right here, the end of this point, which is what we call the comb guide, and the inside of the hive is about three eighths of an inch, ish. 
<laughs> work with me here. I can't hold it still right. But that distance needs to be there for what they call bee space. It's the space that the bees use to walk around the comb. It's the same space that's created between two bars by the fact that this bar is an inch and three eighths. So they draw a comb down from here and the hallway is three eighths. So that three eighths inch is, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a beekeeping thing, knowing what bee space is. But the idea here is this gives you a comb guide that's as long as it can possibly be going across the hive. And that helps to keep them straighter on the bar. The bevel point means that they, they kind of, if you put bees in a box and it has a flat lid, they'll build on that, but they'll build wherever they want to. You know, there's no defining bump or edge or something to catch on to tell them build on here. So that's what this is doing. The fact that it's so deep, you know, the, the, height of that beveled point gives them space to attach up both sides of the bar, which gives them better ratio of attachment to the weight they're holding. And the, the fact that the comb guide runs as long as it possibly can without getting into their B space keeps them straighter on the bar. So you can do a lot of top bars. I mean, that right there with nothing, if you stuck a bunch of these in a, in a hive, you'd have a top bar. But you probably find your bees come along here and go, Whoop, and now you're connected to the next bar. And, you know. So having a, an effective comb guide is super huge. Having it be as long as it can be to fit the length of the, or the width of the hive is, uh, is crucial. That just works, makes it work about 85% of the time. And the other 15% you can pretty much attribute to either the hive isn't level or bees do as bees please, which is a catch-all term for like, we don't know why they did that. <laughs> So asking a question from the point of view of a suburban homesteader who's living in Orange County, which is pretty densely populated, mm -hmm. is keeping a, a top bar hive even practical for me? The, you know where I would start with that question is, is it legal to keep bees where you live? <laughs> and that might mean your zoning guy has something to say about it. There might be a beekeeping ordinance. There might be a homeowners association you're a part of. That's worth knowing too, because they can be pretty fussy. Um, but other than that, there wouldn't be any difference uh, between keeping this type of hive and any other style of hive other than the ease, you know, that, that a top bar affords. But um, it, it starts to take you into situations where you need to be very aware of swarming. That's what I would really put uppermost in your mind in, if you're living in a densely populated area for a couple reasons. The first one is it swarms freak people out because it's a whole lot of bees, a whole lot of noise, and then people get like shook up by it. They're the least ferocious at that point, most docile and easy to get along with because all they want is to be safe until they get into a new cavity, but it, it's not good PR, let's say. So being aware of bees and what swarming is and how it works and how you can prevent it means that a you don't freak out the neighbors b the bees don't move into their roof line on that little crack where they really should have caulked that last summer when they did that work you know those little spaces bees getting into a cavity inside a wall ta-da now you got bees in your house now some levels that's not really a bad thing i wouldn't mind having bees in my house you know but the problem is if the bees die and they leave behind wax and honey now you've invited critters and if a honeycomb, a big, a substantial honeycomb collapses inside a wall, you will literally have honey running out of the wall at some crack, whether it's at the floor or around the window frame or something like that. So, and you don't really want, you know, rats and mice and raccoons and anything else that might be interested in that wax and honey to be going in there after it too. So it's really a question of if you're going to keep bees in a densely populated area, be on top of your game know what's going on, know that bees, their prime directive is to make more bees. So swarming is one of the most welcome things you could ask for in that way, but it isn't so cool if your neighbors next door don't, don't think it's cool. Other than that though, the big advantage to a top bar hive still at this point, probably won't be for much longer, but most people look at it and don't know what it is. Enough said, right? <laughs> Enough said. Yeah. So on the subject of swarming, how do you minimize or avoid that? 
Well, you kind of want to encourage it, but you want to have some control over it because otherwise the bees doing a natural swarm, the process goes along, they make bees, they make bees, they make bees, the hive gets big, they're quite confident now and robust and sort of badass if I'm allowed to say that on a podcast. And they decide, okay, we are this, we're gonna become these. So it's kind of a cell division thing. They start to do things like they start to make drone babies. You get male bees, you start to see nectar is building up in the brood nest instead of in a honeycomb or just up at the top of a brood comb. So nectar in the brood nest was a, that's a subtle thing that you gotta learn to look for. And then suddenly you'll see queen cells. And by the time you see queen cells, they are pretty convinced that they are gonna go. And what that looks like, if it plays out with no interference from a human, is the original mated queen and about half the bees leave behind about half the bees, plus all the brood and all the food that was in the hive. And they take off. The sound is such a magical, weird, crazy, scary thing. It's hard to describe it, but it's a little like either like a faraway train, you'll hear this roar, or maybe it sounds like somebody's running a blow dryer in the next room. I mean, it's a roaring noise that you just go, what in the world is that? And then suddenly you turn around and there are just thousands of bees in the air. And they're, it's weird because that's a lot of bees. It's not like you can count them. You know, you can't say that's X number of bees, but it's a ton of bees and they're all swirling around. It looks a little scary. And then they eventually start to coalesce, probably on a branch, but you've got a television, right? You've seen them show up at the San Diego Padres game. Oh, those bad people. <laughs> you know, they glom onto something and hang there in a blob, or I've seen them on mailboxes, always makes the news if they glom onto somebody's car. Saw a picture once of a swarm hanging off the chain of a bicycle. But basically what they're doing is they're sort of bivouacking, and while they're there, they're sending out scalpies, and the scalpies are looking at various locations, and they have an amazing system that only bees know about. <laughs> I mean, we, we think about it, but they figure out what location that the scalpies have visited, is the best one to go to. And they come back, they get that whole vote thing done, and then runner bees travel around on the top of the swarm and kind of wake everybody up because they've been sort of just, we're staying cool, you know, under the radar. The runner bees get everybody woke up and whoop, off they go. And they move into that space, which a lot of bees moving all at once is a pretty uh, dramatic thing. If, if it's the kind of thing you like, then it's beautiful. If it's the kind of thing that terrifies you, then it's horrifying and scary and bad, but it's how we get more bees. So it's really a beautiful kind of natural process that I would go a great distance to protect. But if I'm living in an urban situation and I don't want to go 80 feet up a tree for bees and I don't want to be pulling them out of my neighbor's roof line, what I'm going to do is watch for them to prepare to swarm and I'm going to split them, which is essentially an artificial swarm. It has one drawback in that you don't really ever get as complete a drop in the brood level as you would in a natural swarm, but you get pretty close. So that helps to drop the varroa mite load. That's one of the beauties of it too. But you can watch as it's coming and split them on purpose, put them into two hives. Now you don't have to chase them. And they're gonna, this one's already moved. I got the queen, we've got all these bees, Da da. we go forward. This one's gonna raise a queen. We got all these babies and food they're gonna pick up and go forward from her flying to mate and coming back and starting over. So splitting one hive that's robust enough to swarm is one way to get more bees and one way to prevent the natural swarm process, which is just so random that it becomes a danger in a densely populated area. For someone who's never kept bees and mm -hmm. you've pretty much sold me on a top bar hive, what's the average startup cost when I'm looking at this and how much money does it take to keep it running? Well, we really did some work this year to target startup people, newbies, we like to call them. So we looked at it as you need a hive, but you need a certain set of beginner stuff. Like you want your hive, you want a feeder, you want a hive tool. I don't happen to carry jackets or gloves, but you should get some of those. But when you go to buy your second one, you're only going to need, you know, the hive and a feeder. So we packaged up like what we call a newbie single. It's got the hive, it's got a feeder, it's got a hive tool, it's got both of my books, 
without access to a class. And that basically gets you everything you need, aside from your protective gear, to, to be a brand new baby beekeeper starting one hive. But you'll hear from a lot of different ways and sources that starting with two hives is good. So we took that same concept, but you don't need two copies of my book. So you get one copy of the book, two feeders, one hive tool, two hives. That's what we call a newbie double. That's somebody who's trying to get started with two hives. The advantages of having two hives is just sort of mind blowing. First off, you learn way more than twice as much, more like 10 times as much. And the resources you have in one hive can be useful in the other. That's one reason for having interchangeable equipment and all every gold star top bar is exactly these dimensions and has been for ages. So you can move things from hive to hive. The most dramatic time that that comes into play is if you have a hive and it's lost a queen, the bees can take a three day old larva, like it takes, the egg is laid, it's egg, 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 and then it hatches. And on that day, they can take that, that larva and turn its cell to make it vertical. How they do this, I would really like to see. But it used to be a little cell in a comb. Now it's a lumpy, peanutty shaped thing on the front of a comb. And when it's vertical and they feed it royal jelly and probably some other magic that we don't know about, that bee turns into a queen bee. So they can replace a queen on their own if they have that just hatched larva, three day old egg just hatched larva. So being able to pick up a piece of brood comb in this hive on this top bar and put it into that hive because they need a queen. Being able to do that is amazing. If you don't have that to do, you've got a hive that's just going to go down the tubes, turn it into a laying worker, and essentially, you know, just spin out and die over the, about six weeks or so. So being able to support them one with the other from parts from the other makes it really nice to have two. So let's do some quick numbers. If we take that newbie single that I mentioned, that's going to be your hive, a feeder, a hive tool, and two books, 750. Shipping happens to be included. Then you need your jacket and gloves. Say that's $100. Then you need some bees. This year we sold package bees for $185 a piece. That comes in right around $1035. One hive, education, tools, protective gear, bees. Then if you take it up to the double, then you're adding in, I think it's another $700 for the additional um, hive and feeder, but you've already got everything else you need. So from then on, all you're ever adding is another hive, another feeder, and some bees. <coughs> and so it's, I was just gonna say, it's just about $1,000 to get going in, uh, in, in one hive. And if you'd like to start with two, and either start out with two, or you could also look at that as, you know, remember how it's their prime directive to make more bees, right? You end up with a swarm, you need a box for it to go in. So if you have an empty hive around now, you are one step ahead of your equipment curve, which is another enviable place to be. You like to have extra equipment around in case you end up with a swarm where you need to do a split. I was at the park yesterday with my son, and mm -hmm. there were a swarm of bees feeding on are actually drinking the water off a rock on a waterfall mm -hmm. and it just took me a second to think about wow the microbiome that I, they are picking up from the moss and water on these rocks that will eventually end up in their honey is what I will gain from the honey is that correct absolutely everything that so, they bring back uh, and put into the honey <laughs> So honey itself is a wonderful probiotic and antibiotic. Is that correct? Yes. So well, I'm not that knowledgeable with what constitutes or creates a probiotic, but if there's something healthy and beneficial in what the bees are gathering and putting into their honey, then you're getting it when you eat that honey. So whether that's pollen that you're allergic to and you get it in little micro doses that helps your body develop antibodies to it, to me, that's the life-saving thing. I have such a pollen allergy, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I lived in Hampton Roads, Virginia for 18 years <laughs> before I started keeping bees. And, you know, how much Benadryl can you actually stand to eat? You know, it saps your energy, makes your scalp crawl. I hate taking stuff like that. So when I got to Maine and started keeping bees and realized about my second year, I'm like, you know what? My allergies have completely just like vamoosed. That's huge. I mean, that's a health benefit that I would wish on anybody. <laughs> that's awesome. And then when you think about mead, for, for goodness sake, the, the quality of the mead 
is coming from the variety and the contents, the, the stuff that makes up the honey. So it's flavor, it's enzymes, it's everything that the bees gathered from the plant and put into that honey. When collecting honey from these hives, is it a continuous thing where you get various amounts or does it typically happen uh, like on a scheduled basis where you collect a lot? Well, someone who is driving their bees specifically for honey is putting a bit of a schedule to it and harvesting quantities all at once. Now that's, that's pretty typical in the commercial large scale world. If you are a backyard beekeeper with 10 hives or less, you know, somewhere between one and 10, then you have different options. Um, one of the fun things about a top bar hive is that if this was a bar of fully capped honey, you could pull just this bar out and harvest that and then give them back the bar and they go right back to, you know, going to town on it. And that bar is probably somewhere between two and eight pounds of wax and honey. So now if you want liquid honey, you got to get it out of the wax and you lose a little bit more weight there. But that's um, very different from taking what they call a super, which is a box of frames filled with short, so they're easier to lift, um, frames that have nothing but honey in them, where you take 10 of them at once. It's a lot more work to harvest it. It's a little bit more of a shock for the bees when you give them something else to continue to make honey in. It's a bigger climate change thing for them. So being able to manage one bar at a time, two bars at a time, as opposed to it's October, harvest all the honey or whatever month would be appropriate, um, which has been so typical of honey harvesting that we think it should happen in the fall. That feeds into a really odd situation for a beekeeper who wants to keep their bees alive over the winter. Because if you take what you guess is a, the right amount of honey in the fall, and it turns out you didn't leave them enough for them to eat over the winter, that is sort of not the direction we'd like to call sustainable. What we like to recommend is let the bees have everything that they can make, especially in that first season, because that very first season, they've got to make all the wax if you started from a package and it's, it's, you know, it's a big deal getting established. But in the spring, if they came through the winter and you still are looking at honey and you're also looking outside and you see all kinds of bee food, like the dandelions are out, there's clover, there's, you know, the bees are in full forage and there's honey in the hive, you might call that surplus honey you might actually write your name on the bar and say, that's mine. And at that point, you're not endangering their ability to overwinter. Now, you might find that you get a dearth where there's no nectar flow in the summer, depending on where you are. That happens in different climates around the country. But uh, if you have let them get through the winter on their own food, then you're not faced with the struggle of what do you feed a bee in the wintertime? Because they can't, that for them to stay warm, they have to stay in a cluster. So it's literally bees on top of bees and the combs running through them and there's some travel holes so that they can get between them, just usually just right there below the bar. Um, but the whole idea of staying in cluster keeps it from being possible to put a syrup jar in there because they can't leave that cluster to go over to it. So honeycomb, hang straight down from the bar, right in there in the middle of the cluster, and it's the perfect food because it's in the perfect place. It's where it has to be for them to eat it. If you're gonna supplement their feed in the winter time, it's a little complicated because it's gonna require that you do something like that, that you can get the food up against the cluster of bees. That gets a little more challenging. So we like to say, why not just leave them, let them have their food, harvest it in the spring. Although if you'd have seen the look on the guy's face that I said that to first, you would have thought I had sprouted a second head. He just he could not believe that I would suggest such a thing. But now I have people come up and they see me at shows and they're talking to their friend and, and, and they go, oh, no, you just harvest in the spring. I said, oh, that's how I knew we got saturation. He <laughs> had the info out there. Harvesting in the spring can be done. But for a long time, it was apples, honey. Oh, that was fall stuff. You take it to the fair, you know. So it's a bit of a change up in how we have done it for a hundred years. I have one more question. Speaking of winter, yeah. um, are hives or top bar hives more likely to survive the extreme cold in winter? I don't think you can put a likeliness on the bee survival that ties to the hives. It, it was a convenient scapegoat for a long time. 
lot of Lancashire beekeepers wanted to say that a top bar hive could not be overwintered, but I know people who have done it in Canada, and I know people who have done it at 7,000 feet in the mountains. It's really, it's not the hive. It's whether your bees have protection from wind. This is what we call the three four-letter words of winter. Wind, food, if you take all their food and then expect them to get through on fake food, that's you know not a likely outcome. And the, the last thing is cold. And the fact is, you can do something about the wind and you can do something about their food supply, but you can't do a thing about the cold. But the, when they stay in cluster, they're able to keep that ball of bees at 55 degrees. They're not heating the box, but the ball of bees is 55 degrees. And that's a pretty effective mechanism for staying warm and staying alive. But if you can prevent a strong prevailing wind from beating on your hive and beating on your hive all winter long, then you've gone a big step in the right direction towards protecting them from winter. And if you let them have their own natural food supply, same thing. So it's not tied to the box. I mean, they're, you know, Langshus beekeepers and top bar hive beekeepers are, are we're crying the blues all the time now just about bee loss in any case. So it's, uh, you know, if, if I thought for a minute the top bar hives were impossible in the winter, I probably wouldn't have started Gold Star honeybees in Maine. <laughs> so, That's a yes. really good point. Yeah. But, you know, people look for, does this work better than that? And the fact is, bees are cavity nesters, and whatever cavity you put them in, you just have to understand how they're going to interact with it. And Christy, have, have you heard of Paul Stamets? I recently heard about his research looking into putting certain types of fungi into the sugar water, and that helping the migratory beehives uh, withstand all of the pesticides and pests that they encounter. Are you familiar with this? I have, uh, Paul Stamets has gotten above my radar more than once uh, pretty recently. And he, I think he's really an exciting, uh, he's got a hold of an exciting thing. First off, you know, fungi and, and what, what comes from that, the natural process there is awesome. But if you think about that and you think about how connected these are to everything, mycelium is it's like the same thing. It's just like overlaying the connectedness of bees with the connectedness of, of mushrooms, essentially. and um, the beautiful thing about what he currently seems to be working on is that it's helping with this virus problem that I mentioned that's so pernicious and so mysterious because like I said, you can't, you can't tell that you have most bee viruses without having your bees tested in a lab. So just the fact that they are likely to self-medicate if the mycelium is available to them uh, out in the wild, on the ground, um, or as an extract put into the sugar syrup, like has starting to look like it's going to become a product here soon. Um, I th that just speaks to connectedness to me in a way that I think that's really, really, really relevant. <laughs> so the fact that it is um, fungi, that it's mycelium related, that it's, uh, you've probably heard some of the stories about how the mycelium munched up toxic piles of oily gunk compared to other ways they tried to get rid of the same type of pile of oily gunk. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty high form of, of biological magic, if you ask me. So I, I can't see that, that it could be anything but pretty amazing. I really want to see where, where that goes. The, um, the beauty of it is that the one type of mushroom, of course, names are unpronounceable at this point, but the... Um, uh, the fact that it just increased the health and the and dropped the virus levels in their groups, you know, you got your control group that had nothing and you got your test groups with these two other fungi, uh, the phenomenal uh, percentage of effect is, please let's pay attention to Paul Stamets <laughs> because I think that's just a really valid thing and uh, certainly worth... Uh, Try, if you're going to supplement your bees with something, let's not do it with chemicals. Let's do it with something like, like fungi. That just makes a whole lot of sense to me. I'm really glad to hear that because I felt the same. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's, uh, he's a bit of magic. Him and his little mushroom hat. I really want a oh. mushroom hat. I want a hat like that so bad. <laughs> I know. And I've heard so many people say that. He's got it going on with a hat most definitely. Yeah. True. I'm going to ask, so I'm going to ask you then, where people can find you online. Um, okay. Like we've got your website and if you've got any other thing you want to mention like YouTube or Facebook or whatever. You can find Gold Star Honeybees 
at www.goldstarhoneybees.com, but there's a lot of other ways to connect with us too. We do, of course, have a business Facebook page. There is a YouTube channel that is uh, about to undergo a serious redo because it's kind of aging out. Um, there's an Instagram channel that I don't use much, but the thing that I would encourage other beekeepers to do, people who wanted to interact and talk about beekeeping and get questions answered, et cetera, would be go out to my website and go to the connect page. On the connect page is a link to Top Bar Hive Beekeepers, which is a Facebook group that's global. And I think I saw it had just crossed over 6,000 or it's about to. Uh, so that's, and that's beekeepers all over the world. Most of them keeping top bar hives or thinking about getting into top bar hives, curious about it. Uh, and then there's one for every state. So you might say I'm sort of drowning in Facebook, but 50 groups, one for every state, one for Washington, D.C., a special request, and then one for several countries as well. So the beautiful thing about Facebook groups is the ability to post pictures and interact and ask questions and that kind of thing. So I would encourage anybody wanting to know more um, about getting hands on with it, connect. Go to the go to the website, hit connect. Uh, it was the title of my TED talk, so I kind of just put that theme forward. And then um, the next thing that's coming up, this is brand new, not launched yet, is I'm going to start a Patreon page. It's called the Thinking Beekeeper, and it's basically me interacting as the author of the book and my thoughts, my feelings, my answers to your questions. Um, I'm working on another sort of pamphlet-like book on. Uh, called tips and tricks of building top bar hives. And I don't know how much you know about Sherlock Holmes. I'm a fanatic about Sherlock Holmes. And one of the things about Sherlock Holmes was when he retired, he became a beekeeper, which just, you know, makes my heart go pitter patter. <laughs> so Sherlock Holmes, uh, who doesn't even exist, right? But Arthur Conan Doyle, who was writing the stories, was submitting them to a magazine called The Strand, one at a time. So now you buy a compendium of, you know, Sherlock Holmes stories, but that releasing them one at a time is something I'm going to do on Patreon with chapters of the Tips and Tricks book. So it's going to be um, material that, that will be more dynamic. Like one of the challenges when you write a book, and I'm sure you saw this happen too, you write the book and now that information is static. And you can't really even comment on it without looking for some channel to interact with people. So that's what that will be about. It's like, you no, know, we used to say this. Now we're starting to see this, this, and this. And there's been a lot of changes, like viruses in beekeeping. Let's talk about that for a second. I'm not going to write a whole book to talk about that, but it's one of the big frustrations nowadays because only two, maybe three viruses actually show any symptoms. To know that you had the virus, you'd have to take those bees and get them tested in a lab. How many beekeepers are going to do that? Not very many. So the virus thing could be our whole problem as far as we know. And then, you know, then what? How are you going to fight that invisible enemy? So I can talk about that kind of stuff. And uh, it'd be just a great way to pick. And uh, there'll be little bonuses for people that join up on it. So watch for the Thank You Beekeeper on Patreon. All right. That sounds good. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I learned a ton. Awesome. Unbelievable how much I learned. Christy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and spending your valuable time talking to us. It's been truly fascinating. I went from pretty interested to now very interested. Well, I'm glad to hear that, but I always feel like any day I get to talk about bees, that's a good day. <laughs> it is a good day. <laughs> I want to say thank you again very, very much for doing this podcast. With Absolutely. Us. Thanks for having me. Great to see you both. Yay, bees. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>